Welcome once again to the Icons. I'm your host, sports professor Rick Harlow. This month, a true icon in the history of college football. On this episode, an incredible conversation with Lou Holtz. Let's get started by going inside the icon. Lou Holtz was born on January 6, 1937, in Fallensby, West Virginia, the son of a bus driver. Holtz attended Kent State and graduated in 1959 with a degree in history. He played linebacker for the Golden Flashes, despite standing 5'10 and weighing 152 pounds. Holt started his coaching career as a graduate assistant at Iowa. His head coaching debut was at William & Mary in 1969, followed by NC State, a one-year stint as head coach of the Jets, Arkansas, Minnesota, Notre Dame, and South Carolina. As a head coach, Holtz won 249 games, 33rd all-time, including a national championship with the Irish in 1988. He retired from coaching in 2004, but has been active in broadcasting since that time. Holtz was elected to the College Football Hall of Fame in 2008 and awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2020. The coaching legacy is great. We'll get into a lot of that. But so it's January 6, 1937, and you're in this world. You're not sure of your senses because you were just born. Did you have any idea at any time that you were going to be destined down the road to be one of the most successful coaches in history? Oh, absolutely not. I, let's remember, I was born during the Depression. My father had a third grade education. I was born in a cellar. We had two rooms, a bedroom for myself, my sister, my parents, and a kitchen and a half bath. And that bath did not have a tub of shower sick. There was no welfare, no food stamp, no safety net. Nobody from our family had ever gone to college, let alone graduate. So I had no intentions. All I wanted was a job at the mill, a car, of five dollars, uh, and who could ask for more than that? So it's just amazing how people affect your life. And I'm here because I've had so many great people guide me and help me. You're here also because you uh, almost won 250 games, I guess one short, 132 and seven in a turbulent uh, world of college football over so many schools. That's hard to do, I think. And when you take a look at your career, which is primarily college, we'll get to the Jets in 76 in a second. Uh, the thing that strikes me about all those schools is the diversity, the different cultures, the different structures. Were there commonalities as a head coach? that you found early on in all of those programs that could you, uh, you could use to increase the likelihood of your success? Well, that's a great observation because when you coach at Arkansas, it's different than coaching at William & Mary, et cetera, and you have to adjust to it. But you have to have a philosophy. And my philosophy is very, very simple. Life, life is nothing more than a matter of choices. Wherever you are, good or bad, because of choices you make. You do drugs, drop out of school, join a gang, get tattoos from all over, get arrested. You're choosing that difficulty in life, and please stop blaming me for the choices you make. So all I've ever tried to do was teach the athletes. I never felt I coached football. I felt I coached life. Just make good choices. And it doesn't matter whether you're a football player, a husband, a father. If you make good choices, things are going to be positive. As you got more experienced in the what's my next job role, because you had many and you held them well, uh, were there certain things you looked for in the administration, in the funding, in the relationships that would cause you to be more comfortable, let's say, as you chose Arkansas after the Jets or as you chose Minnesota after Arkansas and on and on? I, I wished I was smart enough to do that, but <laughs> I felt that every situation had potential to win if I could contribute to it. And what's important is how you approach the team the first meeting. And one of the first things I would say to them is, I know you had no idea who would be your coach, nor did you have a say in who would be your coach. You didn't have a vote. And if you did have a vote, I wouldn't be here because many of you are going to judge me predicated upon what you heard about me as a disciplinary. I understand that. But what I want you to understand, I had a choice. I had a great job, a great family, a great home. I didn't need to move. Why did I move? Because I thought if we worked together, we could really accomplish something special. And so that's how I approached basically every job. Well, and as you got into that first meeting, uh, and we'll talk, believe me, about NIL and Transfer Portal and all of those things. I don't want to get you wound up too early in the interview. But on all of those items, as you see coaches moving from place to place, uh, and you know, some would say 
leaving the students behind. Others would say going for an opportunity like anybody else in any profession. Uh, did you feel like there was an extra presumption kind of against your credibility because you've come in from somewhere else? Or, or, or would it be easier if you come in from the inside? Uh, you know, talk about that. Well, when you take over a job, you understand you aren't going to be the most popular guy because everybody else wanted somebody else. Your second day, you can't remember this guy's name. The third day, you don't recruit this guy's cousin. And next thing you know, you build up an awful lot of animosity among you. But, you know, the most I made at Notre Dame was 115000 And as after my sixth year, we had won the national championship, enlarged the stadium, signed the NBC contract, so they raised my salary from 95000 to 115000 But money was never that important to me. I think being happy with your family and being happy when you looked in the mirror was, was far more important. But, you know, coaches making $8, 9000000 million a day. So what happened? The coaches started chasing the money. Then the players start chasing the money, and that's why we have the NIL today. And then pretty soon now, the schools are chasing the money. They're going from this conference to that guy. How in the world do you have a Big Ten with Southern Cal and UCLA in it and Rutgers on the other coast? It, it makes absolutely no sense to me. It used to be a time you joined a conference because you shared many things in common. You had the same academic standards, so to speak. You are pretty close to uh, geographically. And you had the same objectives as far as uh, athletics are concerned and academic. But that's no longer the case. Now it's all about the money, and I think that's unfortunate, which I'm sure we'll get into later. I, I think an athlete should be paid if he works at McDonald's. But he should be paid to go to college. He gets a free education. He gets tutor. He gets the best facilities. The buyout clauses, look, it's a free market. Every agent tries to negotiate as high a buyout as you possibly can. On the one side, if a coach were uh, a shareholder in a public corporation, he'd get big dollars and people wouldn't think about it twice. On the other hand, these players rely on the coaches and you shouldn't be able to move at a moment's notice, regardless of what the contract says. They're somewhere in the middle. So talk about that one for a minute, you know, coaches staying put or not. Well, when I first started this profession, a coach was in a school like forever. Bear Bryant was in Alabama, Ben Schwartz, Waller at Syracuse, he had Joe Paterno, Daryl Rose. They didn't move around, but they also had security. But it's just crazy the lack of loyalty that we have. And I find the lack of loyalty by people in general toward, towards life. I, I think loyalty is one of the greatest assets you could possibly have. What do you think is going to happen long term transferring to the transfer portal slash NIL? I'm combining those issues for obvious reasons, because those two wouldn't work as well without the other one. So I, I think an athlete should be paid okay. if he works at McDonald's, but he should be paid to go to college. He gets a free education. He gets tutor. He gets the best facility. He gets all the film to make him the best athlete he can possibly be. He has the girls and the adulation of the student body, and the list goes on and on. To me, you go to college, you get an education. Why do schools have athletics? Because it's one of the greatest learning lessons you can have. On the football field, I learned more than I ever learned in a college classroom. You learned about perseverance, about teamwork, about being unselfish, about picking up off the ground, disappointment, about accepting your role, putting the welfare of other people ahead of you. And I, I, I was fortunate as an officer in the Army. Now, I learned a great deal about the military, and I coached a great deal about it. The thing about the military, in this country would be better off if everybody had to spend a year in the military. We wouldn't have some of the problems we have now. Because what you learn is you have an obligation to the guy next to you. If you don't fulfill your obligation, it may cost him his life. And when you understand the obligation you have, that, that you, you just sort of focus a little bit different. But I, I think that paying athletes... It is the worst thing in the world. Uh, they're they're going to get out there without a hundred thousand dollars in debt or uh, student loans, whatever else the case may be. So I, I think that has really created a problem. I think the transfer portal is going to ruin college football unless they change it. Why do I say that? Uh, when when I was younger, I followed Major League Baseball. I can give you the starting lineup today. For the Cleveland Indians, either 48 or 54 when they won the pennant and it won the World Series. But 
I followed baseball because you had the same players year after year. Now you can't tell. You, you look at some of the great teams in the country today, and I think Washington, Oregon, and Southern Cal are three contenders for the national championship, and they're all from the Pac-12, which hadn't been in the playoff in quite a while. All three have transfer quarterback. You panic with Washington. Right. Uh, Bo, Bo Nix is, is came there from Auburn to Oregon, and then the great quarterback at Southern Cal transfer from Oklahoma. You don't know the players from day after day, and the transfers, it, it just is amazing. I, I'm watching Ohio State because Notre Dame has a big game with them on the 23rd of September. And Ohio State's offensive line got whipped by the defensive line of Indiana. All four of them were transfers. I don't know where they came from. If you're coaching at Kent State and you have a good player, he's going to end up transferring to Alabama or somewhere else. And you don't have many players transfer in. So the transfer portal has really ruined it, along with paying athletes. I, I, I do not miss college athletics the way it is today. But if they don't make changes... They're going to lose an awful lot of support. How do you fix it? What, what do you do when President Emmert said two years ago, two plus, athletes will be paid in some context and don't go away. We're going to give you a memo by the next July to tell you how to do it. Whoops, the memo didn't come. And then how do you deal with that? Do you put the, uh, what is it, toothpaste back in the tube, Junie, Ju- Jeannie back in the bottle, what you, <laughs> whatever the metaphor is, how do you fix it? <laughs> that is a little difficult, but... See, they don't have a real commissioner of college football. We need somebody to say, what's in the best interest of college football? I know they're worried about lawsuits and everything else. But perseverance, you pick a school because you want that school on your diploma in the long run. You want to have the context there, the education, etc. That's why you go to a school. And, and you aren't going to always be the best football player. And you have to be patient. You have to wait your time. You, you have to have perseverance, but always put the team welfare. I'm at Notre Dame. We have a quarterback uh, named Kevin McDougal out of Miami, Florida. Played behind uh, Rick Meyer for three years. Never played much at all. Finally, his fourth year, he's going to play. We have a freshman quarterback come in. It's great. Ron Palace hurts his shoulder at practice, can't play. Kevin McDougal leads us to 11 and 1 record. It was a set all kind of passing records in Notre Dame. Here's an individual just waited his time and, and be persevere. And, and you learn how to improve and to overcome your deficiencies. Everybody wants instant success today. Oh, I want, I want to be the star. I want to start. I want, and that's not the way life is. I was taught the obligation responsibilities you have is more important. Now, today, everybody wants to talk about the rights and the privileges. It's my right. It's my privilege. Do this. Do. No. You also said, in answer to a question over the last few months, that 50 years ago or so, players were worried about uh, obligations and responsibilities. Today, they're worried about rights and privileges. I think I know, but what exactly do you mean? Well, it's really true. You know, 50 years ago, people talked about their rights and uh, talked about their obligations and responsibilities to other people, to the school, et cetera. And that was very, very important. Now, remember this. I, I was coached in high school, and uh, mo- most of my coaches five years before were fighting a war in either Europe or in the Pacific, whatever. And they had a different approach about life, and they came back, and they felt very strongly about that. That's how I was raised. That's how I grew up. That's how I played high school football, although it wasn't very good. But I was taught the obligation responsibilities you have is more important. Now, today, everybody wants to talk about the rights and the privileges. It's my right. It's my privilege. Do this. Do. No. That, I, I've seen this country change in so many different ways. I'm trying to write a book titled Freedoms I've Lost in, in the 86 years I've been on this earth. But it's it just something I believe in in the bottom of my heart. And I think I look at what made this country great. I look at what makes an athlete great. And the same thing with a business person or a teacher. is somebody that makes good choices and you follow three rules. There's only three rules we need. You don't need a dog. You do what's right. You have any doubt, you get out the Bible. You do the very best you can. Not everybody can be all American. Not everybody can be an A student. Everybody can be the best they can be. And the last thing you do, 
You know, you show people you care. You never go meet anybody again that need a smile, a kind word, encouragement. That, that's part of life. We're going to be downhearted. My my wife, I was married for 59 years. I lost her over three years ago. And she never did an interview. She did one interview. They said, what did you learn from having cancer, Mrs. Holtz? She said, I learned how much my family loved me. We didn't love her anymore, but we showed it. When do we have to wait for somebody to have a catastrophe before we reach out and, and help them? So those are the only three rules I've ever used in coaching, raising my children, etc. Those three rules have never let me down. You follow those three rules, you'll make Don't write choice. that book yet uh, because you're not experienced enough. You need about 10 more years of collective experience before anybody's going to let you write that book, okay? <laughs> because right now, you, you know, there's not enough there. 10 more years. I'm kidding. Write the book. It'll be a bestseller. We know it will. Let's talk about your career, your ESPN 10 years, your CBS before that. Um, Reflect back on your broadcast career. Was it as hard or harder than coaching? Did it require some of the same skills? Talk about it. Well, you know, it was interesting because on television, you just talk and you think of something <laughs> to say. But I'm fortunate to be on there with a guy named Reese Davis, one of the most talented people I've ever been around, and a guy named Mark May, who I love and respect tremendously. And we had fun. I think it's important to have fun with what you're doing. If, if you have fun doing TV, people are going to have fun watching you. It's like Tom Sawyer painting the fan. Oh, is this who I have fun? Well, they wanted to pay him to be able to paint the fan. So just have fun with whatever you did. And that's all I ever tried to do was be fun and share my thoughts and ideas and my feelings from my heart. Not because it's something they expected or this would be clever. This is how I feel and this is how I believe. And I, I feel this way very, very strongly. He came into my office and said, Dad, I, I want to be a coach. I said, have you told your mom yet? He said, no. I said, well, make sure she's unarmed when you do because she'll shoot you. Did you ever feel like you are able to use your platform of, of being a you know, well-known broadcaster to uh, not change the game, but emphasize things that are important in the game? I, I, I never looked on myself being a spokesman or anything else. I just try to follow those three rules and just say what you feel in your heart is right and proper. And sometimes I get in trouble. Yeah, it's the people you work with. I've always been fortunate to work with great people and, you know, and have fun. And, you know, and on ESPN, we did uh, uh, the final verdict. I think where Reese would dress up as a robot. Yeah, I remember right that. side and Mark may take the other side and that was for real because you know Reese Davis ruled against me at Ohio State I got so bad I tipped over the whole tripod whatever else because <laughs> it was wrong and I took I, if I'm going to do something I'm going to do it as well as I can for as long as I can and Father Hesburgh gave me some great advice when he was 92 he hired me at Notre Dame great friend of mine he said Lou I'm going to continue to do everything I can for as long as I can, and I'm going to do it as well as I can. But I'm no longer going to worry about the things I can no longer do. And that was the best advice I've ever got for a guy who's really gotten old and can't play golf the way he used to. And lo I love the game. How about being proud of your your son? Uh, you know, not only at East Carolina and South Florida at, at Louisiana Tech, but but also with the Stallions, that that uh, that that team, uh, you know, relative to the USFL, and, and and now he has a title of temporary special assistant at my alma mater, Northwestern. What is that? What is a temporary special assistant? Well, I talked to him yesterday. He doesn't have anything to do with the team on the field, but the head coach had, had never been head coach. He's never a defense coordinator at major school. And Skip talked to him about recruiting, about organization, practice, things along that line. I think he could help the team if he was on the field and coach because he is an excellent coach. I met Notre Dame, but he came into my office said, Dad, I, I want to be a coach. I said, have you told your mom yet? He said, no. I said, well, make sure she's unarmed when you do because she'll shoot you. Door. But he wanted to go into coaching, so I wrote five different coaches. One of them was Tom Osborne, one of them. Uh, was Bobby Bowden at Florida State about a graduate assistant for him. And Bobby Bowden hired him at Florida State, and they had great success there. And he, he just he's a, he, great with people. He's I've known him most of his life. He's the most positive person I've ever been around. He's always upbeat, et cetera, and, and gets along well with everybody. So I am very proud of him, but I'm proud of also our other three children as well. They 
all graduated from college and married and are happily married, and that's all you can do, you know. I don't care what you accomplish in this world. If you aren't successful as a husband and a father, you fail. So I always felt that that was the most important role I had, was to be a good father and a good husband. Thirty-four years as a head coach, the best game, best win. You're not going to say best win. We have a number of them. Is it the 1988 Notre Dame season at the Fiesta Bowl, or, or that's got to be among them? What 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 would you say to the best win question? The greatest win, and probably tearing my life around, was at Arkansas. My first year there, we we get invited to the Orange Bowl to play Oklahoma. And the last time Oklahoma had played Arkansas. Arkansas lost them like 106 to nothing. So everybody was all excited. Uh, but then I had to suspend three athletes and scored 78% of, their touch, of our touchdowns for the year. And that's a fact, 78%. And we could down there, we became the largest underdog that's ever been in a major bowl. We could down there, and, and we beat them 31 to 6, and the game really wasn't as close as the score would indicate. Well, I will tell you this. I am uh, proud and honored to be part of this. I'm really excited that you gave me the time, but also excited that you remain a vibrant force in the business of college football and life. Coach Coach Holtz, thank you very much. Rick Harrow, speak with you soon.